Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to uh, Introduction to Moving Water. My name is Bruce Lowe. Um, I'm a paddler and I want to share some experiences with you. I'm just gonna play around with some pictures and stuff just now before we get into a slideshow. Um, and I'll put my glasses on so you can see. A, I want to talk about paddling. This is just some random photos of stuff that I've done and people I've been with and places I've been. A, as a kind of a motivation for rivers taking you places and meeting people and seeing things. Because when we're talking about moving water, we're talking about being on rivers, whether they're flat water, like the Mississippi as it runs through the cities, or whether it's like up at the North Shore paddling harder stuff. I want us to focus mainly on like class one to three, and I'll go into the classification stuff in a few minutes. But I've been lots of places while I've been on rivers. This is India. This is Scotland, canoe over a waterfall. Uh, friends in Scotland where I first started paddling. And a good crew of people were still, and still in touch with. Just learning how to kayak. I actually swam out of the boat there because I wasn't a kayaker then. Friends in Austria going paddling in gorges. Italy, camping, wow, Victoria Falls. There you go, all these things. That's the Nile. And now I'm paddling with my son. A little river, that's his name, the background there. Sea kayaking, set up paddling, all sorts of stuff. Sea kayaks, mostly white water, in canoes, inflatables, going down rivers for fun with kids, with people who are some of the best paddlers in the world, all sorts of stuff. Solo descents, expeditions, hanging out with some amazing places. And I want to share how to get there with people, because if you're watching this, you're obviously interested in floating down rivers and they can take you to amazing places and see amazing things with amazing people. So that's what I want to talk about. So there we go. Let's get into it then. Um, you know, paddling on moving water. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. What does that mean? It's how to look at moving water, rivers, uh, to figure out where to go and how to navigate the currents. How do you get to where you want to be? And a lot of people are put off by rivers because they, go, they don't understand how water works and they don't understand what they're looking at and how it can help you. And for beginning paddling, the water, the river, will help you if you know where to go and how to get there. I want to start off with um, what we, I, I said we were going to talk about uh, here on moving water. Um, and I believe, I'll just get up my little uh, detail that we were talking about. The goals of this little trip, uh, of this presentation. There we go. Uh, we're to gain an understanding of the, the international river classification system, which is what we're starting to look at just now. Um, focusing on class one to three, like I already said, uh, and how you can use that classification and guidebooks to discover where you want to go, new places. And we'll get into guidebooks a little bit later as well. Uh, and then talk about river currents. Okay, just basic stuff. For how do rivers work? and how to read those currents and spot obstacles and tactics to maneuvering the canoes or kayaks or rafts or rubber duckies, whatever it is, inflatable kayaks, whatever it is you want to use. Basically, how to look at a river and figure out how to get down it and looking at the easier rapids to do that. If you have anything that you want to bring up, please add it to the, um, is it the comments? A, and we'll get a message to us and I'll answer questions as they come in. Uh, and uh, figure things out. If you want clarification on something I've said, anything like that. And no question is a daft question, okay. Um, right then, so the international grading system, if you read this, so it's a system that basically describes how hard rapids are on rivers. And a river isn't just one uh, classification of, of rapids. Rivers are split into sections. 
you have the upper section, the middle section, the lower section, you have this gorge or that fork of the river, and they're graded uh, according to the highest uh, classification of rapid in that particular section. Yeah. Um, and the, if you know what the classifications are, you can figure out where you want to go. Oh, this section is a class one. It means it's pretty easy, okay? This section is class four. I don't want to paddle class four, so I'm not gonna go there, okay? And you can get a better uh, idea of it if you look at the links on the bottom of the page there. AmericanWhitewater.org is an amazing resource. Um, it has a, an inventory of rivers for the whole of the United States and it's split into states. So you can look at Minnesota and pick some rivers in an area and it will tell you the classification and just river descriptions. It's like an online guidebook. Um, it does lots of other things as well. It's an advocacy for paddling as well. Okay, and it says whitewater, but it's for anybody who wants to paddle down rapids, no matter what type of craft you're in. And then you've got paddling.com, which is an online kind of like magazine. And there's lots of uh, people who input and write articles and give advice on that. And some of them are, are the best in the world at it as well. And, but that goes into the river classifications. It's basically a really good resource for almost everything to do with, with uh, paddling. All right, next. So the river grading system, let's get into it, okay? It's international. Uh, basically a class one river here is the same as a class one river in Europe, in Asia, in South America. There are some little idiosyncrasies like if you're paddling harder water like class four and above in say Idaho, you might find it a little bit harder than paddling class four in uh, Minnesota. That's because the rivers are harder there because they're much more continuous and longer, okay? But basically it's the same system all over the world. And it goes one to six, there we go. Nice little picture um, that I got from paddling.com, a class one, two, three, four, five, six, and a what it might look like, okay? Little waves, bigger waves, a little trickier, even trickier. Oh my gosh, that looks horrible with waterfalls and then you've got a death of the waterfall, basically. So let's look at class one to three. That's all we're doing. We're looking at beginner stuff. We're looking at easier stuff, okay? We're not going to go into four, five, six, okay? But it just gets harder as it goes along. And so your skill level and your experience have to be uh, more. So class one, look at that. It is a fast moving current, small waves. Few obstructions, easily avoided. It's low risk and easy self-rescue. If you do capsize, it's easy. Just fall out, swim to the side, drag your gear with you, okay? Always paddle with other people so they can help you, okay? So that's class one. Class two straightforward rapids. So you're looking at something that's like, oh yeah, that looks like a rapid, but it's wide open channels that are evident without even scouting. Scouting means you get out at the side, stand on the riverbank and look at it and point your way down. So you don't even have to scout. You can if you want to. There are occasional maneuvering required, like you go around a rock. You don't just paddle straight down the middle. Okay, you might have to go from the middle to the left but you're not gonna be making a slalom, zigzagging your way around. It's pretty easy, maybe once or twice. Trained paddlers, if you've done any paddling experience with other people and they've taught you some paddling, it'd be easy to avoid anything, okay? Rocks or what they call medium-sized waves. And swimmers are seldom injured, okay? You might get a bruise bumping your leg off a rock, that's about it. But hopefully by now, you know how to swim in a river if you don't. If you don't. And if you don't, it's easy to learn. You basically line your back with your feet up. Don't try to stand up. And then class three, it's harder. Rather, it's a moderate, irregular wave, strong eddies and currents. If you don't want to know what an eddy is, we'll get into that in a few minutes. Complex maneuvers and good boat control are required. So you're at a higher skill level. Major hazards are easily avoided. So you see the word, it's easy again, okay? We're not getting into super hard stuff. 
but you're going to have to make some complex maneuvers like ferry gliding or paddling upstream to avoid stuff or back paddling to avoid stuff or maybe having to make any turns and things like that okay a little bit more technical stuff scouting is recommended for inexperienced paddlers you want to get out and find your route but it's not going to be a hard route because hazards are easily avoided self-rescue is usually easy and injuries to swimmers are rare okay so it's not what we call dangerous water you still have to be careful. Don't paddle alone. Wear a life jacket, wear a helmet. Okay, paddle with people who know more than you do if you can. Okay. So let's look at currents. Okay, so the river description was saying, talking about currents, easy currents, harder currents. Okay. We're going to go into the, like the utopian river. All right, what does the perfect straight line river uh, currents look like? Right, where does the water go? Well, if it's a straight line, if the river's going straight, it's going in a straight line. Okay. The arrows, the thickness of the arrows there just basically represent the fastest flow. There it is in the middle. And then it just gets less and less, less fast as you go down. Okay. And that's on the surface. Okay. That's what's usually happening. This is all laminar flow. Okay. So under the water, the water is doing stuff. And this is the perfect underwater channel. Yeah, there's no obstructions under there, okay? You've got the slowest layer, there's more friction. That's what slows things down with the air or the side. And then the friction decreases as you get into the middle, okay? And that's where the fastest current is. In fact, the fastest current is just under the water in the middle, if it's a straight line, okay? So if you fell out of your boat or you drop something and it's just under the surface, it will move faster than something that's on top of the water. So if you're swimming in a river, you're probably going to travel faster than your boat, which is floating on the surface. Okay. If you do fall out or somebody's chasing you. Okay. So laminar floors, layers, distinguished by speed and friction basically causes it to slow down. Okay. Hopefully we're all getting that. All right. And that's the perfect thing without any obstructions in the river. And here's a little a movie that I took. Hopefully you get to see this. If you look at what the water is doing in the middle and then at the sides of the river. Okay. And this is this is just a Minnehaha Creek. I was just telling somebody, Minnehaha great place to look at. There you go. See how the water's spinning around on the surface because it's slowing down. See how the water's moving faster in the middle than it is at the sides. And that's the friction, friction of the rocks. Okay, so hopefully you saw that. There was something else going on in there as well where you saw kind of waves, small ripples coming off the side making a V form. And we'll talk about that. That's a, it's a feature made by obstacles in the river that can actually help you figure out where you need to go. All of the Vs, but we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay. So let's talk about going round a corner. So there are corners in the rivers. Where does the main flow go? Well, it doesn't stay in the middle. Okay, there's momentum behind the water, so it pushes to the side. Okay, and we can talk about flow, how much water is in a river a little bit later as well, um, if we get time. But the more water, so medium water level, it's normal, a normal flow of water you'd normally see in any river, the water will start to bend round to the side with um, the corner. Okay, so we're starting off in the middle here. We're going down here and the momentum and the weight of the water just pushes it to the outside and it starts to curl around the corner there. Okay. What happens on the outside is under the water, you'll find some erosion. So on the outside of a corner is where you will find obstacles like trees falling down or rocks falling off the side. On the inside of the corner, here at number three, 
Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, at number three, where are we? The slowest moving. So the, the main water is going on the outside. There's less water coming in the middle here. And that's where you get the shallows. That's because the waters are moving fast enough and the things are deposited there, the rocks, the sand or whatever. So you will always find slower moving water and shallower water on the inside of a current. It's a handy thing to know, okay? And you will find faster moving water on the outside of the corner, okay? And it, because of that, it causes erosion, which causes obstacles to fall out. So shallow water on the inside, faster, but probably obstacles on the outside. And somewhere in the middle, you'll find deep enough and water that's going at the speed that you want to go at. And probably less obstacles there as well. Although on the side, on the inside of the turn is actually quite a safe place to be as well. Okay. So a river tactic for going around corners is stay on the inside of the turn rather than following all the way around the outside. The river's trying to push you to the outside. That's where you turn and point towards the inside of the corner and try and not hug the bank, but stay on the inside of the turn. And that's a river tactic for getting around corners. Okay. And it helps you, gives you time to see obstacles if there are any. It also means that you can get to the inside turn, the inside corner faster and get out of the river if you want to. Okay. And here we go is a, a little bit of a, another mini ha ha video of water going around a corner. Main flow coming down here, going under this bridge that's starting to move to the right-hand side of this video. You see it's causing slow, non-moving water on the inside. That's called an eddy, like a parking spot. We'll get into eddies again soon. Okay. So you see the main current going off downstream, hugging the right-hand side, slow mover, possibly safer water going around on the inside. And every time it goes around a corner, the main current will start to shift from where it is to the outside of the corner. Okay, the kind of S shapes or zigzags. And that's in a, a nice, easy, normal flow. Other simple flows, shallow water, deeper channels, Bs, okay. So shallow water, we've all seen rivers, okay. And sometimes you just come up against shallows, okay. The easy way to spot shallows, okay? If you watch this, you will just see ripples everywhere, okay? Now, the smaller the wave, okay, means the shallower the water. And if you're seeing ripples everywhere without a channel, it just means that whole area is shallow. If you see smaller ripples and then some bigger ripples uh, somewhere else in the rapid, it means the bigger waves are deeper water, okay? All right, so small waves is sh really shallow, bigger waves is deeper water. But in a shallow bit, you might just look at all the waves and go, they're all really small. But if you try to discern the size of the waves, okay, you'll see some are a little bit bigger than others. And that can often point to the route that you want to take down an area that is all totally shallow. So, oh, I didn't want to do that yet. Let's have a look at this video. Again, many have, see little ripples everywhere, but there's obviously some deeper water here, just to the top of the middle. And it comes down and the river's spreading out. So it's all becoming more shallow. If you can see a main current, you just pause it. There's a main current going down here to the right of the island. And there's less water going down here to the left. So less water will usually mean it's probably shallower because there's less water covering the rocks. And more water going down to the right means there's probably a deeper channel. So again, more tactics, but it's also the size of the waves that will tell you what's going on. Okay. We also have a corner going on around here, going around the island on both sides. Okay, but the channel is wider on the right, so it gives you more space to maneuver. So you probably want to go down the right hand side of this. Okay, so you're looking at the volume of water going round obstacles. You're looking at things that can give you ideas about to the, the channels that you want to go to, down. Small waves, big waves, uh, faster water, slower water. And we all remember physics classes in the, the ripple tank, okay? 
smaller rapid, smaller waves mean shallower, slow moving. Okay, deeper is faster moving. Okay, so it gives you an idea about speed that you're going to go to as well. Hopefully, this is all making sense. I'm not just waffling around too much. Good thing about things like Minnehaha Creek or some of the other small rivers around here is everything you see is a miniature version of a bigger rapids, bigger rivers. Okay, um, so if you, even if you look in the in the, the rain gutters on the streets and if you find rocks are swept in there, you see they make waves, they make eddies, they make V shapes, they make channels. Just small versions of what's actually happening on rivers as well. And if you're sad person like me, you actually like looking at stuff like that. You can send little floaties down it and figure out which way they go. And deeper channels. Okay, here we are. We're actually looking down from Minnehaha here, down um, at the bottom of the steps at the restaurant at Minnehaha Falls. And you can see in here, there is some V shapes. You see the channel of the rivers, the, the cha river channel is narrowing the river making it deeper and the waves are slightly bigger. Okay. You still have obstacles on both sides of the main channel. And that's where the rocks are and they slow down the water with friction, make it a slightly more turbulent, but you can just like paddle straight down the middle. Okay. I wouldn't advise doing it on Minnehaha Creek because the bridges are really low. And follow the V's. V shapes mark channels around obstacles. Usually two obstacles, one on each side of the V shape. And if you go down the middle of the V, it'll give you the route in between those obstacles. Okay. And for class one and one and two, is definitely you just need to find one V shape and it'll take you down the rest of it. If you're in a class three, you're going to be moving around, figuring out the V shapes where they are. So you get out and you can sc scout a rabbit and look at the features to help you. Remember, waves are made by rocks, okay? Channels are made by deeper or shallower water, okay? And some waves will point you to the way you want to go. The V shapes is like the head of the arrow and they point you to where you want to go. There's one nice one here on the right-hand side, almost in the middle. And there's one down here on the left, but that will take you all the way around the corner and hug the corner there. This means you don't have much space to maneuver because there's the riverbank is in the way. But here in the middle, you can maneuver around because you've got more space because you're almost in the middle of the river. And you can set yourself up for the next corner ahead where the river current will go from to the right hand side. There'll be slower moving, shallower water on the left. And you can now figure out where you need to go to slow down and get to riverbanks and stuff to help you out. get out and scout, get out and have your lunch, whatever it is you need to do. There we go. Now let's talk about eddies. Oh, let's go back to the last one. I like this. Lots of eddies. Famous eddies. Love it. What is an eddy? Well, apart from being a rock star or a comedian, in a river, eddies are basically uh, pieces of non-moving, recirculating or slow-moving water created by obstacles, either sticking out from the side or sticking out from the middle of the river. Rocks are really good things uh, that we all think about that stick out of rivers, okay? There are also little headlands or points that point out from the side. Uh, some of them are man-made by fishermen, big boulders that can put away to create an eddy behind that fish like to go into, okay? Because fish like a rest. Eddies are basically, you can treat them like parking spots. You can treat them like rest areas, okay? They're a good place to, get out of the main current, gather up everybody who's there, or have a look over your shoulder and see what's coming up downstream. Yeah, they're fun to play with. And when you get more advanced, you can play tricks and stuff with them as well. Okay, but basically there are areas of calm water that can help you stop, take a break. Okay, and they can be in the middle of the river or at the side of the river. The ones at the side are probably the ones that you really want to use. Okay, because they can help you get out of the river and do whatever it is you need to do. I've even got out of rivers and not gone back to them. I've gone, I'm done with this for the day. Thank you very much. Okay, so you can even use them for that. Okay, 
you got challenged by choice when you go paddling on a river. Okay. I want to go back a little bit uh, to make sure that I need this. This is the one here. If you look at this video here, right, you see this massive flat water, slack water, slow moving. And when I say recirculating, it can even be the water current can even be going upstream, opposite to the way the mainstream of the river is going. Okay. So you could pop into this eddy and get to the side, okay? And figure out what it is you want to do. We're just stopping and having a rest. We're stopping and talking, figuring out what we're going to do next. Does the river go? You can get out and walk downstream and see what's coming. You can do anything. You can go for a coffee, a caribou coffee, whatever it is you got, okay? But eddies are very useful things. This is a really good little video just to show you. It's very fluid. You see, uh, there's not much recirculation going on with this video. This water. It's just not going anywhere. So you get in that eddy with your boat and stop. How does that sound? It's amazing. This is really weird not having anybody able to talk back to you. <laughs> By the way. All right, bye bye, eddies. Here's a little breakdown of kind of how they're formed. So this is at the side of a river, okay? Number one is the obstacle. At the moment, it's like a blue circle, which is pretending to be a rock. Number two is the river flow, okay? It's going in a straight line. You've got the main flow right in the middle, and then you've got less fast water at progressively out to the sides. So arrow number three, the obstacle is diverting water. So the water is not just going straight through the rock. It's been diverted, it's been reflected back towards the middle. Now when it gets there, we start to get into a little bit of physics, okay? So there's a, now a vacuum created by that water which needs to be filled up, so it sucks. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. Water back into it. So narrow number four is the, the motion of water being sucked back into that vacuum, which is now not a vacuum, because it's all totally filled up with water, okay? And that's all we see. And it starts to recirculate hard. And then the next hour there from number four, it's still recirculating. It's getting back into that hole created by uh, the water being reflected, okay? It's filling up the hole there. And then number five, okay? It's start of the backwash. The water is going now going to start to not go upstream or stop being non-moving and is now going to start to slowly dissipate back downstream. And this whole thing is helical. It's circling, it's circling, and it's circling back up to the rock at the top at number one. And as you go down through the eddy, it's going to start recirculating and going start to join very slowly back down with the river. Okay. So at the bottom, the tail of the eddy, at the backwash there, that water will start to move downstream. Okay. So after it gets out of the eddy, the currents just start to merge again. And unless there's anything in the way, um, it's just going to merge into our main straight line river again with all the currents, main in the middle, fastest in the middle, and then dissipating out the side again. Okay. Um, and that's what kind of what happens. The obstacles start to change that flow. Okay, and here to make an eddy, we've got a rock sticking out of the water. Okay, it could be a tree trunk, it could be a bridge pillar. Okay, it could be something, it just has to be something sticking out of the side uh, and the water is diverted around it and then the water backfills in a circular motion around it. Okay, the closer to the obstacle creating the eddy you go, the stronger the current of the eddy. Okay, and as you go down through the middle and back out to the backwash at the bottom of the eddy, okay, they start to, the strength dissipates again, okay, and then starts to build up again as it disappears at the end. So this area here between five and six, you might find the current is starting to strengthen going downstream. Okay. But basically, if you get into an eddy, get up somewhere in the middle of the eddy, and get in there, it's usually the canvas area of the eddy, get to the side, okay, and hold on and get out if you want to, okay. 
If not, you'll just float back up to the top of the eddy where the rock is and you'll find yourself hugging the rock at the top. But it's usually a pretty safe place to be. Bruce, we do have a question in the chat. Somebody yeah. would like to know what part of the eddy do you see fish? What type of the part of the eddy do you see fishing? Well, I don't fish. So unless I'm upside down in the eddy, I don't see any fish at all. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, as a non-fisherman, or as I grew up in Scotland by the ocean, I'm more of a sea fisherman. So it doesn't have to do with that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know where the fish are. I would imagine they're probably in the least turbulent part of it, which is probably in the middle there, because it's not moving. They're not going to have to waste any energy there. I have seen salmon swim up river, and once they get over a fall, they'll head for an eddy and they'll just sit in the eddy and they'll rest. So I imagine that they're just sitting in, in eddies in the Camas Park. But apart from that, I don't really know. Yeah. There you go. Right. I hope that answers your question. Thanks for asking. First question of the night. Yes. All right, here's another picture of an eddy. It's a bit of a weird angle because I didn't have a good camera at the time. But here we go. You can see the obstacle at the top of the eddy here. It's actually the tree and the rock. And you can see the difference between the main current where the water is diverted off the, the, the rock. Okay, and you can see the eddy here. This is the eddy. And the line, which is you could call it a wave there, this is the eddy fence, the eddy line. It is the place where it is not the main current of the river, but it is also not the eddy. And some people have called it funny water because the water is doing funny stuff. It's not been a main current and it's not been a current from the eddy. It is swirling around in circles. And that is where you find little mini whirlpools. Or if you're sea kayaking in the ocean, uh, and tides, tides act like rivers, and tides between islands definitely act like a, a river, um, you can get whirlpools. Um, for those sea kayakers out there, if there is anyone, there's a paddle called the Cory Drecken, made by Werner. It's the name of a tidal race in Scotland, and it has one of the largest uh, tidal whirlpools in Europe. And it's basically made by funny water that is just disrupted between water being pushed around all over the place. So whirlpools can happen, okay? But in a river, you're not gonna get anything that big. You can just get funny stuff here. And you basically paddle really hard from the main current into the eddy and you just zoom across the funny water and it doesn't even bother you, okay? But it does take energy and a bit of power to do that, okay? So if you're going into eddies, you're paddling, point towards the eddy where you wanna go, Okay, paddle hard at it, get into the eddy and avoid the funny water. The funny water will spin you around really quickly and probably may even push you back out into the mainstream where you don't want to go. Okay. All right, and so try to paddle nice and strong in towards eddies. Okay, but also be aware that you will turn because you're going from one current, which is going down river into another current, which is either not moving or going back up river. And that causes one part of the boat to turn away from the other part of the boat. Okay. One, the front of the boat will have gone into a current, which is not moving, and the back end is still swinging around. And so you start to turn. And as you, if you paddle with power in towards the eddy, you'll get a carved turn rather than just spinning around on the spot. Okay. If you're spinning around on the spot, it means you haven't paddled in hard enough. You haven't used enough energy to get over the funny water and the funny water will just spin you around right on top of itself. Okay, so another river tactic. Point towards the eddy, paddle hard, get over the funny water into the flat a water on the other side close to the river bank. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. All right then. Here we are, a little anatomy of another eddy. This is a midstream rock. We have flow going straight down the middle, water being reflected off of both sides. But then this little spinny is my homemade uh, drawing skills here on computers, which aren't very good because I'm from the last century. Okay, you'll have a little wave in here like you saw on the previous video, just up here. 
there's a little wave, okay? Because there's water pouring over the top, which is another feature, a pour over. We'll get into that in a minute, okay? And then you got the eddy here behind it, okay? So you can come in from either side of this rock, paddle over the eddy line, into the eddy, and turn around and you'll face upstream towards the rock, okay? And sit and have your sandwiches. Here we go, midstream eddy and its currents, a little bit more technical here. You can see just as the, the with the, the eddy at the side of the river, okay, you've got this circulating water here and it's happening on the end, around both sides of the rock. When the water is going around an obstacle on both sides, you'll get that recirculating on both sides, but it recirculates in opposite directions, okay? And they meet in the middle here, and that is usually where the camas water is, okay? Remember, currents are stronger at the top near the obstacle forming the eddy, and then they dissipate as they go down. And eventually, I haven't put it in here, but in the middle, after the recirculating water, it will just slowly start to merge as one current again. Okay. Sometimes people call that slack water. It's water that's moving, but not at the same speed as the main currents. There you go, and here it is again, a side profile too. Sometimes you get a little wave up here, okay, at the top of the rock in the top picture, okay. So the rock's sticking out, you get a little wave here, some people would call it a cushion wave or a pillow wave. Um, that wave uh, will be bigger depending on the volume, the amount of water in the river and how big the rock is. And then from above, you can see the rock, little wave right at the very front in the middle of the current where the main current is, and everything going around the sides and merging away after the eddy as well. Okay. And then right behind the rock is where your eddy is. I hope that makes sense too. Here we are, another side making a, 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 um, of a rock sticking out from the side. So rather than a, uh, an eroded side of the, the riverbank being taken away, okay, it's just a rock at the side of the river. And it works the same as the very first eddy that we looked at, this one, except we don't have this eroded area as well, okay? Here we go, hope you mind, don't mind me flicking backwards and forwards. But it's the same motion going on, okay? So you begin paddle down here, point at the eddy where you wanna go, okay? Point through the eddy at the riverbank where you wanna go and paddle hard towards it. You'll spin around and keep paddling and you get to the side of the river, okay? You keep paddling when you're in the eddy because you don't wanna get just like your momentum just to push you downstream to the bottom of the eddy and then all of a sudden you're in the back wash going back downstream again. I've got a very interesting story about that, but uh, it's scary because it was above a waterfall. <laughs> I was okay, my boat was. And that's what I was learning. Okay, now here we are at V shapes, okay? So we've shown how eddies behind rocks, eddies at the side of the river. So imagine you got an obstacle on one side of the river, an obstacle on the other side of the river. The main flow comes down and water is deflected off of both of those obstacles, okay? But from opposite sides and that causes that V shape. And in class one, two, and three water, you'll find that it's usually a pretty smooth piece of water. And the, the deflected water meets at a point, and then they join together and they form another main flow away from the obstacles. And that's your V-shape, and that is a nice, safe route to take. Away from the obstacles, it's in between the obstacles, it's away from the eddies, so you won't get spun around on the funny water, you keep pointing downstream and off you go. These are very, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just, yeah, emphasize it. These are your way forward. They point to where you wanna go. They're the gaps between obstacles to show you where you wanna go, okay? All right, here we are. Well, let's, has anybody got any questions around that? Anything there? I hope this is making sense. Follow the Vs. Eddies are parking spaces. 
the currents go to the outside of corners. It's usually safer on the inside of in the slower water on corners, okay? So let's talk about some waves made by rocks. Rocks are the thing that make most waves, okay? Uh, they're the most frequent obstacle in rivers, okay? People will talk about trees, but basically if you see a tree in a river, avoid it, don't go anywhere near it. So sometimes they're just not worth talking about, okay? So rocks are the main thing. Avoid trees, try not to hit rocks, follow the Vs, use eddies to help you. But different types of waves made by rocks. So you have rocks in the river, they're either sticking out or they're underwater. Okay, uh, if they're sticking out, they're going to make an eddy. If there's water going over it, okay, it's going to make different types of waves. The waves depend on how much water is going over that rock, okay, or how much it isn't sticking out of the water. Here, we have a rock that is just underneath the water. Okay, if this rock is 20 feet high, on the far downstream side of the water, okay, you're gonna have a 20 foot waterfall, okay? If this rock is, I don't know, six inches tall, you're just gonna have a very small waterfall in minuscule, okay? This is called a pour over. Well, waterfalls are slightly different. A waterfall is a waterfall. A pour over is basically a rock with water just pouring over the top of it. And you get a steep drop with, a very white wave in there. And the white waves that you see on water, okay, are recirculating water. The water's going around in circles. It's white because it's aerated. There's lots of bubbles in there, okay, because as it drops, it catches the water, the air in there, uh, from the environment. There we go. So you get this, okay, and then it floats off down the stream. And here you can see from above, you get the main flow, and you'll get that pillow or cushion wave on the upstream side, the water will pour over it, and there's the recirculating behind it. Okay. If it's a small rock and you've got a boat, so a six inch, a rock that's only six inches high, and you have a 17-foot boat going over the top of it, it's not going to have much effect. Okay. If it's a, a rock that's three or four feet high, okay, and you put a boat over it, you're going to get a, a bit of a bounce as you drop over the edge. Okay. You might even get stuck in it. Okay, because we we're talking about not much water going over the top of that rock. All right, here we have more wavy stuff. Same rock, more volume in the river. Okay, bigger flow. Okay, and we're getting the water going over the top of it, but it, it, under the as it hits the rock, it's pushed up to make the hump of the wave, and it carries on downstream, and it goes down into the hole created afterwards and starts to form another wave. And then the waves will get smaller and smaller as they go downstream. Okay. And that would be called a standing wave. Yeah. The wave is, and you'll see it there, it's constantly there at that water flow for as long as that much water is going over that rock, that wave will, all, will be there. Yeah. And it's quite predictable. If you went back the next day, with the same amount of water going over that rock, you'd still find that wave there. Now we've got a hole. So this is an in-between stage between the first picture and the last picture, okay? And now we're getting into uh, waves that can cause problems for people, okay? So the, the, the pour over, unless they're big rocks, uh, if they're small rocks for pour overs, you can kind of like bounce around off of them. If it's bigger rocks, you wanna avoid pour overs, okay? Uh, class one, two, and three, you're not really gonna get those bigger pour overs. But this type of wave here is called a hole, a hydraulic. In Britain, we call them stoppers because they're big enough and you hit them in a boat, everything just stops, okay? There's a lot of power in those if they're big. Class one, two, and three, you're not gonna really mess around with them. It's the sort of thing you will, you'll either avoid on class three, you're not gonna see them on class one and two, apart from in a really small scale. And then the, the thing about them is, because it's recirculating water, so it's take an eddy, and flip it on its axis so it's vertical instead of horizontally flat, okay? If you hit it, that moving water is gonna spin your boat, okay? Handy if you want to turn around, you can use it. Uh, not very handy if you just wanna paddle straight there. So white water, if you see a wave with white water behind it, 
for people at the beginning level, you probably want to avoid these. And you can see them because the water's white, okay? Which is really good in this part of the world. Anyway, in the Midwest, the water is made a waves that uh, aren't disturbed with catching air is dark. Waves that catch air and recycling that white frothiness, okay? They're easy to see. You got black and white water, okay? So you can see that stuff. If you go out west and you're in rivers that are more glacial or you go up into Canada and Alaska on the west coast, glacial rivers, everything's the same color, so a little bit harder to see. Um, but we probably don't need to talk about that. Here in the Midwest and out to the east, you don't have to worry about that, okay? Most of the water is either black or white, okay? White means frothy. You get a little spin you around, okay? There we go. And you see afterwards on the wave as well, It'll cause that wave, it'll feel as though there's an eddy behind there. It's swirling water, it's slack, it's slow moving. It'll spin you around as well if you turn it behind the wave. But then eventually it will form into the main flow again. If there's no other obstacles behind it to disturb it. Okay. So there we go. That is that. But now we're going to talk about guidebooks. Okay, so we've looked at brief description of classification of rivers, it's international. We're going to class about class one, two, and three, which is the easier stuff, okay? Uh, and now we know a little bit more about how rivers work, okay? Main flow, fastest water is in the middle, just under the water. When it goes around a corner, the main stream is pushed to the outside, store water on the inside. You'll find probably obstacles on the outside of turns, so it's usually safer on either in the middle, as you keep in the middle of the river or keep to the inside of the turn as you go around corners, yeah? Okay, we've found that eddies are really good. On the inside of that turn is where you will find an eddy. You'll also find them behind obstacles in the middle and rocks. And you can use them to stop and look downstream or get to the side of the river and get out, okay? Or just have a rest. Depends on what you want to do and how you're feeling. Remember, it's challenge by choice. So how does this pertain to guidebooks? Well, guidebooks use this classic uh, international system, okay? Guidebooks all over the world. But some guidebooks look, oh, sorry. I forgot about this bit. Before we get into the guidebooks, let's go over this stuff again. And so class one, fast moving, few obstructions, low risk, okay? Class two, straightforward, wide open channels, okay? Occasional maneuvering. So class one, you don't really need to maneuver. Class two, the route is pretty easy and you don't really need to maneuver very much. Trained paddlers will easily avoid, yeah? So even as a non-trained paddler, you should be okay. Class three, Major hazards are easily avoided. So class three has hazards, but easily avoided, okay? We're going class four, five, and six, totally different, okay? They're not so easily to avoid, but up to class three, they are. So if you want to push yourself, don't worry about it so much. Scouting is recommended for an experienced paddler. So remember, scouting is get to the side, get out and have a look, okay? Self-rescue is usually easy okay you might need to swim for a few minutes but uh, you'll be okay probably i used to judge uh, the depth how much river was in one of my local rivers back in scotland because i used to swim all the time it took me years to remember, learn how to row and uh, i would judge oh yeah that's that's high water today my legs didn't hit any rocks oh that was pretty shallow today i'm gonna have a lot of bruises tomorrow okay you'll probably be okay so guidebooks at last Here's a selection of different guidebooks that I have, um, and they are different types of guidebooks. Two of them are local. One is Northridge Whitewater. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. It says Whitewater, and people get put off by Whitewater. That guidebook uh, by Jim Rada um, has everything from class one up to class five. The Mississippi River Companion is great, okay? It describes the Mississippi from the source 
all the way down through the recreation area and um, down past St. Paul here. And then uh, one from a trip I did many, many years ago when I was really young. I still got hold of it because it was an amazing trip in Nepal. But all three of these have different types of ways of describing the river, but they follow the same discipline of the classifications of the river. Okay. So here we go. The Jim Rada book on the left is, um, okay, uh, St. Croix River, Taylor Falls. It's 0 0.2 miles. It's class two to three. So that's the bit we're really focusing on just now. It's class two to three, okay? And if we remember our classification, class two, wide open channel, straightforward, occasional maneuver. Class three, easily avoided hazards. Scouting is recommended, okay? So it gives you an idea about what is there. Okay, wide open channel, I'll probably get out and have a look. A quick description. Big water play changes water level. The jam dam changes the water level, okay? So you can't rely on the weather to, complete, to control that, okay? And it's at Interstate Park, okay? Uh, it starts south of the bridge, okay? And the takeout is the same as the put-in. It's basically the waves under the bridge at Taylor Falls, okay? And here we have a section from the Mississippi uh, Recreation Guide, Pike Island, going around Pike Island. It doesn't really have a grade in here because it's the river's flat. There are no waves. There isn't really any rapids there. So it gives you a description of routes that you can follow all the way down, okay? But you are in moving water. It does have eddies, okay? Uh, it's got an obstacle, it's called Pike Island <laughs> and a couple of bridges, okay? You'll find eddies behind the bridges. You'll find eddies at the side of the river, yeah? Um, and so you can still, some basic river features to help you get down and maneuver around, okay? There we go, and here we go. We've got another part, another river here, the St. Louis River up uh, uh, at Carlton, just before Duluth, okay? And it's the upper section, it's three miles, class two to three again. So it's the same as Taylor Falls. Have you ever been to Taylor Falls and looked at the rapid, um, the rapid under the bridge, and you went up to the St. Louis River, give you an idea about the rapids you would probably encounter up there. But it's three miles long, so there's more rapids. It's easy, there's six rapids, it's play and squirt. Squirt is just a trick you can play with certain types of boats. You start at Carlton, you take out at Scanlon. There you go, you can start at the Thompson Dam, take out Minnesota 210. Boom, there you go. Now these books and their descriptions, there's much more information in there than just that stuff, okay? And here we have for exactly the same system followed just in a slightly different way, in Nepal, you have the lower Kalagandaki. It is from Ramdi. It goes to Narayangat. Okay, it's 128 kilometers, 80 miles long. Okay, and here they have this is going to take you four days. Okay, and uh, you're going to travel to four hours to Pokhara. It's a class two to three. Boom, there you go. That's the information you're looking for. Can I paddle that? Yes, if I want to do a four day trip. Yeah. Okay. And it has a summary about, about what it's going to be like, uh, recommended as an easily accessible and relaxing river trip. Boom. All right. And it's even got a graph there that tells you when you can paddle. June, July, August, September, October, maybe November. December, a bit dry. January, February, March, April, May. A bit dry. Okay. All right. There we go. And then you have the other one, another river, the Indrawati. It's the same sort of stuff. 12 mile section. Yeah, it's a day paddle. Okay, it's class one to two. Oh, that's easy. Okay, I could get down that. Okay, and a small volume, easy river with unspoiled villages, warm water, and easy access from Kathmandu. There you go. You just have to get to Kathmandu first. Okay, and there you go. So it's the same, the classification of the rivers is what you want to go for. And then you have a guide that can tell you what that class means. How easy is it? How hard is it? Do I want to do that? Okay. So even though you don't know where the place that you're in, okay, you can get guidebooks and find out what it's like and figure out if it's what you want to do instead of just turning up somewhere and going, I'm going to paddle this today and finding out there's something really nasty around the corner. Okay. There we go. I wanted to 
show you a little video just to finish off because we've done nearly an hour here um, from a guy who's kind of one of the best people to, to, to of books to do. And it's a guy called John Mason. And it's an old movie, okay? It's from the 70s, uh, but it's definitely worthwhile watching. I've lost my cursor on the screen. I want to come back to me. Ah, here we go. All right, then. Uh, the canoe surfing one is a, a, we might watch it for a time afterwards, but Intro to Rapids. This is the start of one of his uh, movies that he made in the 70s um, as an introduction to whitewater. And just watch this guy paddle, okay? He's on his own. He's an experienced canoeist, and he's going down this beautiful rapid. And just watch how he's doing. He's reading the water, and he's not paddling like crazy. He's steering his boat. So steering is important, okay? Turn, being able to turn your boat and put it where you want to go, okay? Excuse the, uh, here we go. Get onto YouTube first. I think we'll finish off there. If people have got any questions, please send them in. And maybe we can, I can write back to you or talk to you or something like that as well. And I hope you find this very interesting. If you can find any of the books by Bill Mason or watch this stuff on YouTube, it's amazing. And he's an amazing paddler. There we go, folks. I'm going to put that off now. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Goodbye.